Okay, welcome all of you. This is the first day of our two-day session focusing on establishment skepticism. So without further ado, let's dive in. I mentioned at the beginning of the course in the initial lecture that establishment skepticism is centered in Great Britain. And the reason I've chosen to call this establishment skepticism is that the Anglican Church was during the 19th century established by law. It was the official religion of the British Empire and people who held positions in the church were paid through monies that we would call taxes, essentially. So the common folk paid their money to the crown, the crown dispersed some of that money for the actual funding of the church, something which it may be difficult for Americans to wrap their minds around. Within the Anglican Church at the time, there were divisions. The divisions had grown over the course of time. They didn't rise suddenly. Some of them were exposed by the rise of Methodism in the previous century. Wesley always considered himself to be working within the Anglican Church, but many of the Anglicans did not view it that way. And objections to Wesley's preaching, sometimes on the grounds simply of what was called enthusiasm, the way that he worked up people into an emotional frenzy, led to an opposition within the church to that low church, very evangelical party, but that party was there. There had always been a broad church faction, but the meaning of broad churchmanship changed over time. In the late 17th century, when people like Tillotson were considered to be broad church. What this meant is that they broadly favored toleration for Puritans, for example, and even met with some of the Puritans to try to induce them to join with the established Anglican church. Those efforts were unsuccessful, but there was goodwill on their part. By the early 19th century, the term broad church had changed in meaning to indicate a general downgrading of the doctrinal necessities for one to be a Christian at all. And so it's in that latter, more evolved sense of the term that we find the authors of essays and reviews being called broad churchmen or the broad church party. Two events in the 1860s brought matters to a head. The first was the publication of essays and reviews. That'll be our principal focus today and one of those essays in particular. And from 1863 onward, the Bishop of Natal, Bishop Colenso, published a series of works in which he attacked the Pentateuch. These events both provoked political battles uh, centered on the requirements for teaching at a public university and for drawing a salary as a bishop in the Anglican Church. The short version of the public controversies is that the people who wanted to strip the financial support from these individuals lost. And from that time onward, although it took a while for them, sometimes they would win in court and be reversed in another court. From that time onward, there was it was just clear that there was no way to induce people of dubious orthodoxy to leave the church uh, there was no method, no will within the church to make it happen. Essays and Reviews was a work containing seven papers not obviously connected to one another by liberal members of the Church of England. There had been a number of volumes published in a series by John W. Parker and Son uh, under the general title Essays and Reviews, and different classes of divines had published in different ones of this sort. Today, the only one anyone remembers is the one from 1860. This appeared just a few months after Darwin's Origin of Species, and indeed in Powell's essay, as you read it, you no doubt saw his references to Darwin. It discusses various topics, including the evidences of Christianity, Old Testament cosmology, and modern biblical research, all from what was at that time quite a liberal standpoint, though today it would pass for mainstream positions in many of the uh, Protestant denominations at least. Powell's contribution is a critique of the appeal to miracles. 
So Baden-Powell, Anglican priest and professor of geometry, mathematics at Oxford University. He was the brother-in-law by his second marriage to Richard Whateley. Powell had three wives. The first two died. Uh, the second was Charlotte Pope, who was the sister of Richard Whateley's wife. Powell became increasingly skeptical toward the end of his life, and two works demonstrate this very clearly. The first is his book, The Order of Nature, published in 1859, and the second is his contribution to Essays and Reviews. Here's the position he takes in the 1859 book, The Order of Nature. The inductive study of the universe, the recognition of the invariable dependence of physical causes, leads us to infer what he calls the existence of universal reason and supreme intelligence. So far, this sounds like it's a positive case for natural theology, and I think that's the way that Baden-Powell thought of himself and his own project. Now, of course, an argument for the existence of a supreme intelligence had already been put forward by William Paley right at the end of his life in his natural theology. But Powell thought Hume's critique of such design reasoning in his dialogues concerning natural religion hit its mark against the Paley-style argument. It has force, he thought, only against a vulgar conception of the deity as a mere tinkering craftsman. It has no force against a design argument from the grand interconnection of the entire universe. So Hume was right, but only because the argument that was put forward that Hume was responding to was the wrong argument. I should add, just to clarify the timeline, that Hume published his work, or I should say it was published posthumously. Hume died in 1776. The work was left with one of his friends who was instructed to wait a couple of years and then do what he thought was best with it. So in 1779, this last work of Hume's, The Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, came out. Paley's uh, Natural Theology, which is considered by many to be the high point of early 19th century, late 18th century design reasoning came out uh, in the first decade of the 19th century, just before Paley's death. So Paley, I believe, had not only read but was deliberately responding to Hume's critique. That's not the subject of the course here, but just keep the timeline clear. Hume wrote first, then Paley. Powell thought that Hume had anticipated and refuted the entire kind of project that Paley was engaged in. Paley obviously thought differently. Powell quotes several people approvingly. He quotes from Shakespeare's All's Well That Ends Well. They say, miracles are past, and we have our philosophical persons to make modern and familiar things supernatural and causeless. A quotation from Act Two, Scene Three of All's Well That Ends Well. In that scene, a young woman who has fallen in love has undertaken using some arcane arts left behind by her father to heal the king and ask the king whether in a sort of reward for her healing him she can make her choice of all of the bachelors of his court. But of course within the play the point is this is not a supernatural interposition. These arts though hidden are not themselves supernatural. They just involve curious forgotten knowledge which she is exploiting. So Powell quotes this to say that maybe Shakespeare and his great genius had anticipated the idea that things that were thought supernatural and causeless are really made modern and familiar by philosophy, philosophy of that, at that time meaning the study of nature. Natural light, Powell says, and the contemplation of the works of creation may teach the existence but by no means the nature and still less the will of the deity. Here he is paraphrasing Francis Bacon, and then he quotes directly from the Advancement of Learning, De Augmentis, quote, miracles were never wrought to convince atheists. And that is a fair quotation from Bacon. Now Bacon says that the reason for this is that God's ordinary works, general revelations, suffice to convince men of the existence of God. But according to Powell, Bacon gets only part of the way there. He overlooks the more powerful reason that no miracle could be received at all without a previous belief in the divine omnipotence. 
You'll remember from earlier lectures and reading that John Stuart Mill took that kind of position in his three essays on religion and in the system of logic, the idea that we must first prove the existence of God and his omnipotence before we can move to a discussion of miracles as evidence. This is the position also taken in more modern work by people like J.L. Mackey. Again, from the order of nature, from the very conditions of the case, it is evident that the supernatural can never be a matter of science or knowledge. For the moment it is brought within the cognizance of reason, it ceases to be supernatural. If nature could really terminate anywhere, there we should not find the supernatural, but a chaos, a blank, total darkness, anarchy, atheism. So the alternative to an unbroken chain of purely natural causes is not the supernatural, the ground for an inference about the existence and character and mind of God, but rather just chaos, nothing, atheism. It's very interesting to see how Powell uses sources in the order of nature. He quotes extensively from John Henry Newman, an essay on the miracles of ecclesiastical history, first published, I think, in 1843. Newman there argues that the evidence for the miracles in the lives of the saints is as good as that for many of the miracles reported in Scripture. So to believe the latter but reject the former is inconsistent. Notably, Newman argues this because he has made the transition from high Anglicanism and he was one of the leaders in the Oxford movement that pushed Anglicanism as far toward Roman Catholicism as it could go, and has actually become Roman Catholic and would, in the fullness of time, be made a cardinal in the Catholic Church. Newman was one of the students of Richard Waitley, and it grieved Waitley greatly that Newman had gone the direction he had. In fact, while Newman and his fellow Tractarians were publishing Tracts for the Times, a series of tracts in which they argued for a higher and higher movement in the Anglican Church, making it as Roman Catholic as possible. Waitley and his friends were publishing a series of comparable papers called Cautions for the Times, arguing often very directly and point by point against Newman and his fellow travelers. Not all of the members of the Oxford movement went on to become Catholic. Several of Newman's close friends remained behind, and that was an interesting structural issue about Anglicanism, that there was now this very high church party that nevertheless remained true to the Church of England. Powell quotes very extensively from Newman's essay. And in many cases, Newman's making parallels, saying, well, here's this miracle from one of the lives of the saints. This is no more absurd than this other miracle story from the history of Samson in the Old Testament and has attestation that is as good or better. Therefore, by parallel reasoning, you must, if you will accept the one, accept the other. Powell just dryly remarks that an argument from consistency and parallelism may often tell as much on one side as on the other, a not very subtle hint that what he thinks we ought to do in response to Newman is simply drop both. The order of nature generated some controversial literature and would have generated more, I think, had it not been for the fact that Essays and Reviews was published hot on its heels. Still, there is a blistering review in the Quarterly Review 106, October 1859. The review was published anonymously, but it's actually the work of Richard Waitley, William Fitzgerald, another bishop and friend of his, and Whitwell Elwin. Elwin wrote the last few pages of it. The rest was the joint work of Waitley and Fitzgerald. Here, just to give you a sense of how furious Waitley was about what his brother-in-law had done. Here is a long quotation from the review from the early part of it. He starts out by mentioning a play by Johnson in which an alchemist says that when he has the philosopher's stone, the uh, most 
faithful of his flatterers will be distinguished bishops. And he says, if there be among the infidels of England any of so rancorous a temper as to wish to see religion not only conquered, but debased, he must already experience a similar exquisite enjoyment in reading Professor Powell's book, the calm, deliberate declaration by a minister of the gospel made professedly in the interest of Christianity that belief in miracles is no longer tenable and that it only remains for the church to surrender at discretion the literal dogma of the resurrection of her Lord. Powell's essay in Essays and Reviews may have already been written and submitted by the time this came out. But whether it was or not, here are some salient quotations from his 1860 piece. Thus, he says, it is the common language of orthodox writings and discourses to advise the believer when objections or difficulties arise not to attempt to offer a precise answer or to argue the point, but rather to look at the whole subject as of a kind which ought to be exempt from critical scrutiny and be regarded with a submission of judgment in the spirit of humility and faith. And then he asks sarcastically, what is it but a mere translation into other phraseology of the very assertions of the skeptical transcendentalist? That's telling language because elsewhere he expressly names Emerson in a list of some people that he's going through, and clearly he has in mind Emerson's Divinity School Address. Now, it was a pretty grave charge to saddle people like Waitley and Rogers and Cooper with transcendentalist notions. Where did that come from? Well, it arises from the observation made by various Orthodox writers that a fitting disposition is a prerequisite for the proper appreciation of the evidences of Christianity. I think what they are getting at is something that would today be discussed under the heading of confirmation bias. If you come to the evidences of Christianity expecting to find that there's nothing to them, then we should not be overly surprised if you find that there's nothing to them. If you come to them desiring that there should be nothing to them, then we may be fairly sure that that is what you will find, however good those evidences are. But that's nothing different in the case of the evidences for miracles or anything else of that kind than it is in the discussion of favored theories in science. Scientists are not dispassionate, emotionless creatures free from bias. They come to the discussion of scientific evidence of their preferred scientific theories with preconceptions and desires. And I think in the best of the Orthodox writers, we read simply the idea that one should not be given to a vicious disregard or animosity when approaching the evidence, or that will bias one's judgment. But of course, Powell puts a different spin on this. He represents it as an abrogation of reason, a demand for servile acceptance, quote, exempt from critical scrutiny, close quote. And I think this would have been very hotly contested. And in fact, in some of the literature that came out after Essays and Reviews was hotly contested by many people on the more orthodox side of the argument. Here is Powell's representation of his opponents in a slightly larger form. He represents them as saying this, quote, these are not subjects on which you can expect demonstrative evidence. You must be satisfied to accept such general proof or probability as the nature of the question allows. You must not inquire too curiously into these things. It is sufficient that we have a general moral evidence of the doctrines. Exact critical discussion will always rake up difficulties to which perhaps no satisfactory answer can at one, be at once given. A precise skeptical cavalier will always find new objections as soon as the first are refuted. It is in vain to seek to convince reason unless the conscience and the will be first well disposed to accept the truth. Now, this is an interesting passage because it contains, in part, I think, a very just representation of some of these things. Uh, you can't ex expect demonstrative evidence for a historical matter. It doesn't admit of that kind of evidence. Probability is what the nature of the question allows. Good enough. You must not inquire too curiously. That's an odd phrase. How does he mean that? We'll see in a moment. Um, 
exact critical discussion will break up difficulties to which perhaps no satisfactory answer can be at once given. Fair enough. A precise skeptical caviler will always find new objections as soon as the first are refuted. Also, fair enough. But that doesn't mean that the orthodox are giving up the answering of objections as some kind of general category. Here is what Waitley had said from his work on logic, published, it was originally an article in Encyclopedia Metropolitana, and then it was expanded and published in 1849. This is a rather long quotation, but an important one, because Waitley is going to lay out his take on the idea that not all objections need always be answered. Listen to this and see if you see an exemption from reason in here or not. Here are Whitley's words. Similar to this case is that which may be called the fallacy of objections, i.e. showing that there are objections against some plan, theory, or system, and then inferring that it should be rejected when that which ought to have been proved is that there are more or stronger objections against the receiving than the rejecting of it. This is the main and almost universal fallacy of infidels, and is that which men should be first and principally warned. This is also the stronghold of bigoted anti-innovators who oppose all reforms and alterations indiscriminately. For there never was, nor will be, any plan executed or proposed against which strong and even unanswerable objections may not be urged, so that unless the opposite objections be set in the balance on the other side, we can never advance a step. There are objections, said Dr. Johnson, against a plenum, the idea that the universe has no vacuum in it anywhere, and objections against a vacuum, but one of them must be true. The very same fallacy, still quoting Whateley here, indeed is employed on the other side by those who are for overthrowing whatever is established as soon as they can prove an objection against it, without considering whether more and weightier objections may not lie against their own schemes. But their opponents have this decided advantage over them that they can urge with great plausibility, we do not call upon you to reject at once whatever is objected to, but merely to suspend your judgment and not come to a decision as long as there are reasons on both sides. Now, since there always will be reasons on both sides, this non-decision is practically the very same thing as a decision in favor of the existing state of things. The delay of trial becomes equivalent to an acquittal. So, Waitley is urging throughout this passage not that we carve out an exemption from examination and criticism, but that we weigh up the evidence on both sides of the argument. And if we weigh up the evidence on both sides of the argument, then we are bound in reason and in candor to accept the side on which the fewest and least weighty objections lie. It's very interesting to ask where Waitley's ideas about the fallacy of objections might have come from. And I think I have an idea. Going back into the 17th century, Edward Stillingfleet wrote a letter which is published uh, at the end of some editions of Originis Sacrae. And in that letter, he says these things. See if you can see a parallel here to what Whateley was saying. He's writing now to the skeptical author of a set of objections against the truth of Christianity. And in truth, I think impartial advice will contribute more to that end than spending time and paper in running through all the difficulties which it is possible for a caviling mind to raise against the plainest truths in the world. For there is nothing so clear and evident, but a sophistical wit will always find something to say against it. And if you be the person I take you for, you very well know that there have been some who wanted neither wit nor eloquence, who have gone about to prove that there was nothing in the world and that if there were anything, it could not be understood by men, that if it were understood by one man, it could not be expressed to another. Must we therefore quit all pretenses to certainty, because we cannot, it may be, answer all the subtleties of the skeptics? And therefore, I am by no means satisfied with your manner of proceeding, desiring all particular difficulties to be answered before we consider the main evidences of the Christian faith.' 
for the only reasonable way of proceeding in this manner is to consider first whether there be sufficient motives to persuade you to embrace the Christian faith, and then to weigh the difficulties and to compare them with the reasons and arguments for believing. And if those do not appear great enough to overthrow the force of the other, you may rest satisfied in the Christian faith, although you cannot answer every difficulty that may be raised against the books wherein our religion is contained. It seems probable to me that both Waitley and Powell had this passage in mind, and I leave it to you to judge whether Powell's representation of it as asking for an exemption from critical thought is a fair representation. Powell does a few other things in his contribution to essays and reviews. Interestingly, on pages 103 and 104, he names a bunch of the sort of big names in evidentialism, Grotius, Lardner, Paley, Douglas, Campbell, Watson, and he sets Joseph Butler's analogy of religion over against them, not as representing quite his position, but as a more advanced, subtle, thoughtful position. Now, I agree that Butler is subtle and thoughtful, and I, you'll hear me say nothing against him, but Butler himself says quite explicitly in that book that miracles and the completion of prophecy are the two direct and fundamental proofs of Christianity, and that in comparison to those two, all others are subsidiary. So Powell's praise of Butler is a rather selective praise. He's certainly not having in mind what Butler says in Part 2, Chapter 7 of The Analogy of Religion. Powell lays great stress on the argument that a miracle worked on behalf of an obviously immoral doctrine is not to be accepted, right? Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, let him be anathema. He infers from this that miracles are useless if the doctrine is false and unnecessary if the doctrine is true. Now, if you took the course last summer, you will remember that in studying the deists, we came across this line of argument repeatedly, and it was repeatedly answered. The answer was that a doctrine not obviously immoral might be either true or false, and we may stand in need of a clear sign from heaven in order to authenticate it. Are we to trust in the death of Christ for the atonement for our sins? It's not obvious a priori that that's true, and it's not obvious a priori that that's false. We therefore look for some sign accrediting the teaching. Orthodox Christian teaching has always been that the resurrection of Jesus was, among many other things, a vindication of this belief. The Orthodox writers had pointed this out time and time again in response to people like Tyndall, but Powell takes no notice of their responses. Powell knows that many of his English readers will object to the miracles of ecclesiastical history, and therefore they're going to say that miracles were needed in the first age of the church, but they're no longer needed. Powell simply asks rhetorically, when were miracles more needed than at the present day to indicate the truth amid manifold error or to propagate the faith? This case, he thinks, is as good today as ever, and yet today, we don't see such miracles. Now, of course, John Henry Newman actually believed that he had personally witnessed miracles, but Powell could count on the majority of his Anglican readers to be unwilling to go the direction of Newman and therefore to reject Newman's claims. So he's again trying to loosen their hold on the miraculous. And just in reiteration of the case he had made, in his book, The Order of Nature, he says here again in this essay, the entire range of the inductive philosophy is at once based upon and in every instance tends to confirm by immense accumulation of evidence the grand truth of the universal order and constancy of natural causes as a primary law of belief so strongly entertained and fixed in the mind of every truly inductive inquirer that he cannot even conceive the possibility of its failure very strong language. How does that line of reasoning, that kind of appeal to science, differ 
from Hume's argument about natural laws and their violations? Well, I think it differs in this way. Spinoza had provided a theological objection to miracles. Miracles would be evidence that God wasn't smart enough or powerful enough to do the job right the first time and had to come back and tinker with his workmanship like someone who makes a clock but has to come back and rewind it to keep it going. Obviously, that's because of his inability as a clockmaker to make a clock that will go on forever. But God can't be supposed to be deficient in these ways. So there's a theological argument lying behind Spinoza's objection to miracles. Hume makes it an epistemological objection. A miracle is, by definition, a violation of natural law, that is, of some particular law or other. But each law, each particular law, is called a law only because it is backed up by a case as powerful as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. That is to say, we would not call it a law unless we had extensive evidence and no exceptions. Therefore, a miracle must always come off second best in the contest with law. Powell's approach might seem similar to that, but actually it's a little bit different. He has a scientific objection to any break whatsoever in the great chain of natural causes. It's not the pile of evidence in favor of the claim that dead men stay dead that Powell is appealing to. Instead, it's the inductive argument that after all, when we find it in case after case after case, things we couldn't understand turn out to be driven by the working of natural causes that were hidden to us and that patient scientific evidence has revealed, then we are assured that nature is a vast machine with an unbroken chain of causality. Nothing ever happens to violate that universal order, and that universal order is in fact the ground of our best argument for the existence of God. So natural theology, the way Powell wants to do it, is pitted against the particular messy, testimony-based appeal to miracles. Hume's arguments against the power of testimony are therefore of secondary importance. Paul agrees that testimony is not of great weight, but here's what he says on page 141. Testimony, after all, is but a second-hand assurance. It is but a blind guide. Testimony can avail nothing against reason. The essential question of miracles stands quite apart from any consideration of testimony. The question would remain the same if we had the evidence of our own senses to an alleged miracle, that is, to an extraordinary or inexplicable fact. The question is not, was it a miraculous interposition. The question is just, okay, what were the physical, natural causes that brought this event about? Now, on the other side, it had been argued by Whateley and others that there have been many things appearing wildly improbable to us at first, for which we have only the evidence of human testimony, but that these things have been found out later to be true. That's the burden of Whateley's satire, historical doubts relative to Napoleon Bonaparte. Many of the things attributed to Napoleon sound crazy on a first hearing, and yet, if we reason justly, we will come to the conclusion that, of course, they happened. Of course, the, in the spoof, Whateley is asking us to disbelieve that Napoleon ever existed. And there are many physical examples, too, uh, questions of magnetism, questions of... Uh, the fall of meteorites from the sky. Similar examples like this have been cataloged. Whateley refers to quite a few of them in his notes to his edition of Paley's Evidences. Powell responds to all of this that in all such cases we have discovered ordinary natural causes for these improbable events. Every time that we've decided the event was for real, we've also decided that it was purely natural. So every instance brought up by Whateley and others serves only to strengthen the inductive case that the order of nature is unbroken. What we conclude in those cases is not that a miracle has been worked, but rather that there is no crack in the cosmic egg. There is no place where the chain of natural causes is severed. <laughs>
For Powell himself, the aftermath of the publication of essays and reviews was very brief. The uh, book came out in January or February of 1860, just about four months after the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species. Powell died in June of that year. Other people, like Benjamin Jowett, about whom I hope to speak more on Thursday, uh, suffered some repercussions and, and were actually taken to trial in an attempt to strip from them their standing in the Anglican Church, but no charges could be mounted before Powell departed from this life. Whitley probably would have done more directly, but in March of that year, one of his daughters died, and the following month, quite suddenly, his wife died. So he had no time, no leisure to engage in polemics before his brother-in-law was dead. <laughs>